But we'll go ahead and kick off with another legend in the spine field, Dr. Ree. All right, thanks and welcome everybody. So I'm gonna talk about uh, anterior cervical fusion and plating techniques. And you know, ACDF is such a great operation. I dare say for the vast majority of us, it's one of the favorite things that we do in spine surgery because the outcomes are generally so good and uh, patients tolerate it very well. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that it's an operation that's easy to do relatively poorly, and you get away with it because it's forgiving. But if you want to really decompress patients well uh, and try to maximize deformity corrections and whatnot, then really careful attention to detail is important. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to go over some of the finer points uh, that hopefully uh, can help you optimize uh, this already great operation. So. In 2024, the mass, vast majority of ACDFs are plated, and for good reason. Uh, plating has several proven benefits. First of all, it's been shown to reduce kyphosis. So in the old days, people used to do ACDs without uh, fusion or ACDF with a, a piece of uh, iliac crest bone graft and no plate. And believe it or not, if you do one or two levels, the vast majority of the, the time, those will heal probably about 70 to 80% of the time with a solid fusion. But the problem is they heal in this sort of segmental kyphosis. And initially the patients do fine because you treated their radiculopathy. Uh, but what can happen over time is that even one to two levels of segmental kyphosis can lead to a global uh, malalignment problem over time. So this is an example of a patient who had two level threaded cages <laughs> many years ago, and if you're familiar with these cages, the way they gain purchase is by basically uh, disrupting the end plates. And so if you do that, things are gonna tend to settle in kyphosis, and over time, this patient unnecessarily developed a uh, alignment uh, uh, that's suboptimal. On the other hand, plating can potentially improve alignment. This is a patient with myelopathy and a degenerative kyphosis that we treated with a, a three-level ACDF to treat the myelopathy and also improve the alignment. The other uh, benefit of plating is that um, if you use allograft uh, or cages rather than iliac crest, which I don't think very few people use iliac crest nowadays, um, plating has been shown to lead to higher union rates as well. But you know, I think as spine surgeons, we know almost better than anyone else that nothing is perfect, and uh, certainly plating is not, and there's some downsides to it. Um, it does add operative time. You have to retract the tissues more. Uh, it's associated with a range of swallowing complications from some minor dysphagia all the way up to a case like this where there was a chronic plate and screw back out causing esophageal perforation. If the um, plate is improperly placed at the time of surgery to be too close to the adjacent discs, or if the plate migrates into that position over time, you can get uh, uh, the so-called adjacent level ossification disease, or ALOD. And probably the most you know, vexing thing is that despite plating, non-unions obviously still occur. So you know, the act of plating itself is pretty simple. You just drill some holes and fill them with screws. But I would tell you that you know, ACDF is an operation where each step really builds on the one before, and if you do a good job with the step before, the next step is easier. So uh, it's really all the steps leading up to putting on the plate that I think determine the success of the operation. So in that regard, here are what I think are seven important pre-plating and plating technical principles for you to consider. The first is during the exposure, perform a generous soft tissue release of all the fascial planes during the approach. Um, that relaxes the incision, and I think it decreases the amount of force that you have to exert on the soft tissues during retraction. And so in my opinion, it leads to less dysphagia and dysphonia post-op. So you know, I know a lot of people just want to make an incision, stick their finger in there and get going. But I think uh, a minute or two relaxing things, I think in, in many people can help. Once you get down to the spine, do a wide exposure of the longest coli that's longitudinally extensile uh, to the mid portion of the bodies above and below the disc you're operating on. And then laterally, you want to go uh, beyond that upsloping portion of the uncus. And if you do that, it, it really serves two purposes. First of all, it gives you a stable cuff of muscle uh, under which to put the retractors. And um, 
It also helps you center the implant and orient the decompression. You don't want, it, it can be relatively easy, especially when you're first starting out, to get lost and kind of lose track of where the midline is, where the uncus is, et cetera. So a nice exposure, again, will build on the next step. The second uh, uh, important thing to consider is precision in your cast bar pin placement. So for reasons that uh, I'll get into in a minute, that top end plate that I kind of drew out in yellow requires a little bit more preparation than the bottom one. So if you put that top cast bar pin too close, it'll get in the way and block the path of your instruments and make things harder to do. So you want that top pin in particular to be further away, kind of in the mid portion of the body or a little bit above. And that gives you an unobstructed line of sight to be able to do what you need to do in the back of the disc space, which you know the vast majority of the time we're there to do a neurologic decompression. If patients have kyphosis, um, uh, a well-known little trick is to place uh, the pins kind of divergently into the kyphotic segment like that so that when you apply distraction then uh, the distraction uh, force gets converted into a lordotic moment and the PLL can act as a pivot point uh, for that correction. So this is an example uh, of that technique in action. The patient with um, significant uh, uh, myelopathy, uh, really bad disc degeneration and a modest amount of kyphosis, about 40 degrees. And with this technique going segment by segment, you know, you can get a significant amount of co correction uh, here in this case, almost 50 degrees versus pre-op. The third uh, uh, important principle is to fashion what I call a rectangular disc space, consisting of parallel end plate surfaces. And that, again, serves two purposes. First of all, most graphs are flat. So if you have a flat surface that mates to a flat surface, you're going to maximize the graft host contact area. And also, if you do that, again, it allows you to get a good look at the back of the disc space so you can do a nice decompression. Uh, when you're doing this, keep in mind the anatomy of the end plates, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, is that, and I guarantee you of this, in every cervical case you ever see from the rest of your life, from now to the rest of your life, you will find that the top end plate has a concavity to some extent. Now, the more degenerative the level is, it will tend to flatten out, but there's always a concavity. You can see that in yellow there, whereas the bottom end plate in blue tends to be flat. So when you create this uh, rectangular um, uh, end plate preparation, you want to resect the bone in the anterior and posterior lips off of that top end plate and preserve the central portion of the top end plate and all of the bottom end plate for uh, weight bearing uh, and uh, structural load purposes. The fourth principle is then to do a very wide discectomy. Um, and that serves several purposes as well. Number one, it facilitates a wide decompression of the posterior aspect of the disc space. It also loosens up the disc. Uh, and so uh, what it allows you to do is to get better height and lordosis restoration. Uh, and then finally, of course, you can place a larger graft, uh, which means better uh, bone host contact and maybe uh, a better fusion and, and better biomechanical properties. Now, the uncus is the key anatomic landmark for all of anterior cervical spine surgery because it defines what I would call the effective and the safe zones for this operation. It's the effective zone because barring just a few anomalies, uh, if you have done an uncus to uncus decompression at the level of the disc, you will have decompressed the entire width of the spinal cord. And it's also the effective zone because it defines where the proximal root is gonna start taking off. But it's also the safe zone, of course, because somewhere around five to 10 millimeters lateral to it is going to be the vertebral artery. So it's the guardrail for the vert. Now the vert is typically in about the mid third of the depth of the disc space, but it's highly variable, uh, not only from person to person, but from uh, side to side in the same patient and from level to level. So one of the most important things you should do always before you scrub in on an ACDF is to make sure you know exactly where the vert is at the levels that you're operating on. So the discectomy should be wide from uncus to uncus to decompress the cord. And then of course you go out further laterally to decompress uh, the foramina as needed. The fifth principle is then to try to fill the disc space with as large a graft as possible for better load sharing and fusion. So 
In the old days, I used to use Allograft, and, and most of these are commercially available as uh, 14 by 11 millimeters. And they're fairly small. So what ends up happening is in a large disk space, for example, C67, especially in male patients, if you put one of those in, it doesn't fill the disk space very well. So what I used to do is take two of those and turn them side by side and, and do that sort of thing. And it works well, but it's a little finicky. Um, and sometimes you can't get, it, get both of them to fit just perfectly. Um, but here you can see the clinical example um, of what the graphs look like when they're rotated 90 degrees. But uh, currently, uh, what I prefer to use are, are sort of these large footprint lordotic cages because I think they better load share and they're going to settle less. And we published a paper fairly recently showing that these uh, large footprint cages have less settling but similar clinical outcomes in fusion rates. So if you look at the amount of segmental lordosis at the operative level versus pre-op, these cages will generate about six degrees of lordosis per level uh, on post-op day one. And by one year, the vast majority of that's been maintained. They still have 5.8 degrees of correction versus pre-op. If you use allograft, you initially get a similar amount of correction, about 5.6 degrees. But over a year, it tends to settle. And as it does, uh, you lose almost 50% of the initial correction you had. So this is a patient with a modest kyphosis and uh, myelopathy that was treated with this approach. And those are the one-year x-rays, and you can see the um, uh, correction's been maintained. The next step is then to determine plate length. You want to know the location of the discs above and below so that you don't injure them with an errant uh, screw or drill or something like that. And once you know that, you want to pick the shortest plate possible that spans the construct. Because if you do, it allows you to place uh, these diverging screws uh, that can op optimize strength uh, and also pull out strength, pull out, optimize length and pull out strength. And it will also best accommodate settling. So we talked about ALOD, remember the adjacent level ossification disease. Uh, as the construct settles, if you have a smaller plate, it's less likely to impinge upon the adjacent levels. So here's an example of that, a patient uh, uh, that had an ACDF where you tried to keep the plate as far away from the adjacent discs as possible. And then the final step is to apply the plate. And in the sagittal plane, you want to spend a little time removing the anterior osteophytes to allow the plate to sit flush. Uh, usually just take a Lexel and, and kind of garden that off before you even do the discectomy. And um, I bend, amount, uh, bend lordosis into almost every plate. The plates come pre-bent, but uh, usually they're not bent enough. And then you want to optimize the screw length. So this is an example of the old Caspar plate, uh, which was meant to be bicortical. There was no back out mechanism, so you're supposed to put in bicortical screws. But you can see a couple of these screws are just way too long. Uh, on the other hand, if you go too short, maybe you're not you know, optimizing the biomechanical strength. So you know, I try to uh, uh, get bicortical fixation as much as reasonably possible. Uh, it's not always perfect, but uh, I do think that perhaps that may have some uh, benefit in terms of fusion rate and outcomes. So with that, uh, um, uh, I look forward to working with you uh, in the lab on these techniques and trying them out. Thank you. And then who uses a like rigid fixed plate? Fixed screws at every level? If I'm doing like a deformity correction or whatnot, I don't want it to move, so I, I do that. If there, there are some times that you, that you may want a bit of subsidence, particularly uh, you know if you're over distracting of like one or two level collapse disc. But in general, I use fixed screws and whatnot for trauma, for deformity. What about like a standard degen case, like a two level radiculopathy or something? You know, like again, that? I think a little of it is, you know, what I'm a little concerned about is if you over distract the facet joints and you put a fixed screw in you're going to have this, the, the bone subside around the screw. So if I got something that's really collapsed down, I will use, uh, I will use, uh, I, I will, I will use variable screws. Mm -hmm. If it is, if, if it's something that I want it to stay in the position where I am exactly to your point that I'm putting a very big, you know, fully filling the, uh, fully filling the end plate, uh, inner body graft. And then, uh, then you know that then hopefully uh, locking that into position, but uh, but 
fix more than 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 uh, variable. And and who uses uh, completely variable screws? Anybody? The rest of you use like hybrid, fixed, and variable. I, I use right? variable. I, if it's trauma or it's deformity, then I'll use fixed. But everything, everything else. Is yeah, I generally use like uh, hybrid. I kind of use fixed screws up at the top, and then at the bottom level, I use variable because I know that's the level that needs a little bit of settling, and uh, the one that typically doesn't heal as well. Um, how did you so come up with that? Did. Because when the Atlantis plate came out, and those guys were all saying, put your fixed screws at the bottom. Oh, OK. I just, I, I always found that the bottom level, to me, it made more sense that that level needs to subside just a little bit. And also because you have more room from the bottom of the plate to the next level, you don't worry as much about the plate overlapping the next disc level. So that's why I do it that way. Yes? Now that you've kind of transitioned to cages or allograft, do you think the fixed versus variable angle kind of it, it changed your management with the utilization of either of those screws, I guess? Um, no, it didn't really change my management. Um, but uh, I do think that the, whether it's the cage or the size of the cage versus allograft, they subside less, in my opinion. And also because bone, as it heals, it resorbs, right? Whereas the cages aren't going to resorb. So then you worry about, is there a difference in fusion rate? But at least in the series that I did, it, it didn't seem to make a difference.